Hello, everyone, and welcome to the imminent deliveries in the emergency department. This is one of those faded lectures that everybody sort of dreads. And this is because, unlike what we learned in school, ER deliveries are not like OB deliveries. Almost all ER deliveries are never ideal situations. Things don't go as planned. The stuff we learned in school about the cardinal movements of birth and the timing and the quick, easy by the book deliveries, those just don't happen in the ER. That's not ever what I have ever seen in any of the deliveries that I've been a part of in the emergency room. And that's because these are obviously unplanned, untimed and inconvenient. So the way that I'm talking to you about delivering is specific for the emergency department. This is always gonna be something that's kind of a shit show, right? This is not something that is nice and easy. So if you wanna do OB, this is not the lecture for you, okay? This is not typically what you're going to see. Whereas in the emergency department, things always get crazy. So knowing that, I'm just going to focus on the things that you absolutely need to know. None of the extra, none of the fluff, and I'm sure many OBs will hate a lot of the things that I talk about in this lecture. So the big important things that you need to know is people can come into the department with a myriad of complaints. Maybe they're just gonna say they have contractions or they're in labor or their water broke. Some people just have abdominal pain and conveniently forget to mention that they're pregnant. Or some people even just say they peed themselves and thought they had a urinary tract infection. You would be shocked at how many people say they don't know they're pregnant. So beware. So once you figure out that something is happening and this person is very close to labor or potentially in labor, the number one question you need to answer is, how imminent is this delivery? That is gonna determine absolutely everything else that we do in this situation. Number two is you need to prepare for the worst and fast, which means that very rarely are we going to have all of the tools and equipment that is available to the OBs upstairs. So a lot of times you're delivering without gloves or without clamps or without blankets or whatever it is. So sometimes you just gotta work with what you got. And then the number big three thing is you need to realize that after the delivery happens, that's when the hard part starts. Managing two patients at once when you are only one person, even with lots of help, is the difficult part. And that is where things can go very wrong very fast. So the delivery, while it's big, bad, and scary, is often not the scariest part of the whole situation. And a lot of people forget about that. So let's go through this process here. So how imminent is this delivery? We need to know, and we need to answer that question quickly. So here are the five factors of how quickly this delivery is gonna happen. So we're gonna talk about station, effacement, and dilation. And in case you don't know what those words mean, I've included little definitions there for you. Station is always a percentage, and it's how low the baby's head is in the mom's pelvis. We're gonna talk a little bit about each one of these later, but effacement is the thinness of the cervix. Dilation is always in centimeters, how wide the cervix is. And then we wanna know about the timing of the contractions and how many previous pregnancies this mom has had. So let's go through these uh, one by one. Station, again, is... Um, a number. So you can see that where the baby's skull is related to the mom's pelvis. And we divide this by the ischial spine. Now it's important that you know, look at some anatomy on Google, know where those ischial spines are. If you can put your fingers into the vagina and you can feel mom's ischial spines on her pelvis, we're good to go. This baby isn't coming anytime soon. However, especially the further along mom's pregnancies are, the lower that baby is carried later on in pregnancy. So a lot of times moms will have been at zero station or one or two station for the last several months if, or weeks. If that's the case and mom's been pregnant before, 
then we often don't have time. So sometimes the station matters for emergency department, but most of the time it does not. So let's talk more acutely about effacement. Effacement is more useful because it's the thickness of the cervix. However, as you can see from these really pretty pictures, it seems so obvious to us like, oh, is the cervix thin or is it not? What percentage is it? However, while this seems really nice and pretty in picture, especially if you're not used to it or you've done this maybe once in your whole life, this isn't always easy to figure out. Sometimes you can feel the cervix and sometimes you can't. And the importance of it is, if the cervix is still pretty thick and not very dilated, we got time. If the cervix is pretty thin, like paper thin, even if they're only at a little bit dilated, this is a big deal. Notice that we're generalizing here on the effacement percentages. So we're gonna go with a 0%, a 30%, an 80% or 100%, okay? I'm not asking you to get like a 82 and a half percent, right? What we wanna do is general numbers. If mom's already dilated at a certain number and you can kind of feel and you see that the cervix is still pretty thick, we got a little bit of time. And that's just the important part that you need to get at is yes, okay? Give us a general rough estimate. You also should know that effacement goes along with dilation. Very rarely is somebody going to have a completely non-effaced cervix and they're gonna be dilated all the way, right? Just like somebody is not going to be having a thinning cervix and then be completely undilated. So importantly, effacement and dilation go together. It's also important that you know that the mom can be up to six centimeters dilated and that's still not considered active labor because of how long mom still has yet to go. And this is in all pregnancies. So this chart here is something that I think is really handy because I'm not exactly sure sometimes what six centimeters is. So if mom is less than the Chips Ahoy cookie, right? If you could not fit a Chips Ahoy cookie in her cervix, then we got time and she can go to OB and we don't have to worry about it, right? So if we're like baby bell cheese style, we're good to go. We got time. This person is not going to give labor in the department. You can get them to the OB wherever that may be. However, if we're in, I don't know, donut range, then we're really, really close. So I think that sometimes it's really handy to have a chart like this, maybe hanging in the department or have it in your head and understand that if you put your fingers in and you pull them out and you look at them after you have done the measurements, think about what kind of snack you could put in that mom's cervix and then you're going to know where the dilation is. Now, when we talk about timing of contractions, it is infamous out there that a lot of times the paramedics who are skilled and trained do come in and tell you, oh yes, this mom has contractions that are two minutes apart. But you also have to understand that the paramedics have a really hard job and they're in the back of a bus and it's just not ideal. So it's highly recommended that if you have a little bit of time, put your hand on the mom's belly, feel the contractions and time it for yourself. Sometimes the paramedics are wrong. It's not their fault. It's a very hard job, okay? But it's really important that you try to guess at the timing of these contractions. And I don't think that you need a TOCO monitor to do it. I also want to introduce this 511 rule to you because just like the information number hotline is 411, 511 can tell you a whole lot about when this baby's coming. So if your contractions are five minutes apart and each contraction lasts about one minute, you have about one hour before that baby's coming. And that can give you a general understanding of if you're at a significantly larger minute interval. So if it's a six minute or 10 minute, then most likely you have time. If your contractions last a little bit longer, then maybe you don't have time. Or if your contractions are only at two minutes apart, you have significantly less than an hour. So the 511 rule is really practical and helpful, although you have to understand that every woman's body is different and this doesn't always hold up. 
beware of Braxton Hicks contractions. Now I realize I'm not an OB and I'm not the main person to talk to you about this. I'm not always very good at it myself, but you need to understand that the mom's body will practice having contractions almost the entire last half of her pregnancy. And Braxton Hicks contractions is called false labor. So if the timing is very erratic, or if it's gaining strength and then losing strength, or if mom can move around and walk or take a drink and it stops, then it's probably not real labor. Now I realize that we're not like, oh mom, can you get up and walk around and see if that labor is stopping? That's not necessarily super practical, but it is super practical if you're timing those contractions and the intervals are not making a whole lot of sense. Trust what the physical exam findings are that you find and know that Braxton Hicks contractions are something that OB can see, but we're not as worried about imminent labor. Now, the last big part of this is previous pregnancies. And I'm sure any of you know, if your mom has told you any stories that a prima gravida, which is somebody that we call a lady who has never had a baby before, it doesn't matter her age. If it's her first time in labor giving birth, this is going to last longer. Labor can last up to 24 hours, sometimes even more than that. And the cervix has never thinned or dilated before, so it takes a lot longer and a lot more hormones for this to happen. So if the mom just is at nine centimeters or even sometimes 10 centimeters, we do still have time. Let's compare that to a multigravida, somebody who has been pregnant and had birth before, the experienced cervix has dilated and thinned before, and it goes faster each and every time. That means that the more babies this mama has had, the faster this is going to go. So if she has been pregnant seven times before, it doesn't matter if the kids have lived, it doesn't matter any of the rest of that. If she has been pregnant seven times before and tried or attempted to deliver, this mama's gonna sneeze and the baby's gonna come out. It doesn't matter if she's nine centimeters right now or six centimeters right now or seven centimeters right now, she's gonna sneeze and that baby's gonna come out. So it's really important and highly worth your time and energy and effort to find out how many babies that this mama has had. Now, for those of you in the emergency department, which I hope is why you're watching this lecture, Mtala is a big deal. MTALA is a big law that exists currently in the United States, and it means that we can't turn anybody away from the emergency department without a medical screening exam, which means that every pregnant mama, even if you don't have an OB department, has to get a medical screening exam to evaluate how imminent her pregnancy slash delivery is going to be. So you are required to check. Pregnant mama comes in, you're required to check. Okay, if you're required to check and you put your fingers in there and you feel baby, aka hair or foot or nose or leg or whatever it is, you probably don't have a lot of time. If you can't find the cervix on the edge around whatever the presenting part is, you probably don't have a lot of time. And if you can see the baby, you open up those legs and baby coming at you, you don't have time. Don't just close the legs and try to send her to OB. That is not going to work. That's also considered illegal under MTALA. So if mama is in active labor, you have to do it. There's no getting out of this. So if the cervix is still present or thick, right? Or if, if you think that this person can be sent by ground for 30 minutes, you can always call OB and talk to the people that you're transferring to. Okay. If you're calling OB and you're asking them, is this appropriate transfer? They're going to ask you what the dilation and effacement and even what the timing of the contractions are. You need to at least guess. Okay. We're not expecting this to be like an exact science here, but you have to at least have these measurements to be able to talk and like appropriately to the OB for them to be able to give you an answer. So try your best. Okay. Now, what gear do you actually need to deliver, right? So if something is happening and you can only grab a few things, what do you actually have to have? Now, some people are really lucky in that their hospital has a baby delivery kit in the emergency department. However, not all emergencies are, not all emergency departments are that well stocked. And so the truth is, if you, truth comes to shove here, 
These are the things that I recommend you have. You want some cloths and baby warmers, blanket to kind of clean up what's going on. Hopefully you have a gloves and a sterile setup, but if you don't, you might just have to do it in gloves or maybe you won't have a luxury of gloves. Sometimes it just happens. If you can get two to three umbilical clamps, that would be the best. You need scissors or something to cut that umbilical cord with. I don't recommend a scalpel, by the way. If you can get scissors, way better. Get a suction nose bulb. It will be worth it when that baby comes out. So if you have to grab something, that is what I recommend you grab. Now, if you determine that this mama is going to deliver right now, Sometimes you have a little bit of time to ease or prep the patients because it's not coming out at you this very minute. This can lead to awkward conversation and waiting around. So what can you do to ease and prep these patients? The first is let's discuss pain medications. Almost all moms who come to the ER are surprised by the fact that they're not going to get an epidural right now, despite the fact that the baby is halfway through her vagina. I'm not really sure why that's the case, but you don't have time for an epidural and don't page anesthesia because they will not come down to do an epidural in the ER. At least nowhere I have ever worked has done that. So if you need to, you can give mama fentanyl 50 micrograms, which is the drug of choice because it will wear off very quickly. And you can give that to her IV or IM. Now I recommend 50 micrograms because birth hurts but I don't recommend giving much more unless the birth per goes on longer than 30 minutes for that first dose of fentanyl to wear off. The reason I recommend fentanyl instead of any other medication is because the more narcotics you give to this mama, it will go into the baby and it will depress, potentially even stop that ba new baby's first breath, which as we get through this process is the very last thing anybody in that room wants. So 50 dose, 50 micrograms of fentanyl, I am or IV is about all I'm willing to give most mamas because we don't wanna make this any bigger of a shit show than it's already gonna be. The other thing that we can do to kind of help prep um, what's gonna happen is the vaginal stretching technique or vaginal massage technique. So you use two gloved fingers and you put them inside the introitus and you start gently, not ripping, but gently um, massaging the outside of the introitus to stretch and open. This will help prevent tears, we hope. And it also can help with pushing. When you're counting the contractions with mama, especially because she's gonna tell you when it's time to push, not all mamas are good at first time pushing and not all pushes are gonna be the best. So that means you can stick your fingers inside their vagina and say, push my fingers out. And this can help a lot of mamas to kind of focus on something and try to push that baby out. This will also help um, you to have a pulse on the, on how good mama's pushing, especially because in the emergency department, very rarely do we have a tachometer to monitor that um, contraction or the baby's heart rate. So this kind of helps you feel the contractions and it gives mama something to focus on to push your fingers out of her vagina during the, the uh, pushing phase of this. Now, if you have time again, here's a few questions that will actually make a difference. Um, that These are the questions listed here that I think are really handy to know. And I also think it's really handy to know what you're actually trying to get information out of her. So if you're asking how far along are you, what you're really gonna find out is how hard this is gonna be, right? The earlier the mama is, the harder this is gonna be as a resuscitation. So you should prep for that, okay? If you, if you ask mama if she's had regular prenatal care, that's kind of typically gonna tell you how many surprises you're gonna have along the way, right? Because mama doesn't really know how far along she is. So that means again, we need to prepare for the worst scenario. So you probably need to have your neonatal resuscitation kit ready. You probably need to get every nurse in your department in the room. You probably need to call anybody you can possibly call to come help you, right? You can also ask what complications have happened during her previous pregnancies or during this pregnancy. Like, has she had eclampsia? 
Has she had problems with her high blood pressure? Is she a gestational diabetic? That's going to determine how big this baby is. And that's also going to tell us how high risk and how much of a problem that we're going to have. Okay, you can figure out the rest of that. Um, I will also tell you that you can ask mama if her water has broken. And sometimes there's a large emphasis, especially from the nursing staff on this question. And while I appreciate that this can be really helpful information, never depend on this because I've had many mamas tell me, oh no, my water didn't break or my water broke yesterday. And um, none of those things are true. So never depend on this question. Mama sometimes doesn't really know, right? And it's sad, but you do also have to ask if you've taken any drugs or alcohol today, because remember, this is the ER and things never go the way that they're supposed to. All right, now let's talk about the mechanics of the actual delivery itself. All right, so these are all of the cardinal motions of birth and what you're seeing with the movements of the baby's head and the way it goes. And again, remember that I told you at the beginning of this lecture that the truth is, is that you are not going to have time to pay attention to this. I know that the OBs hate me right now, but the real honest truth of what you need to know about the mechanics of birth is don't drop the baby. That's really it. They're slippery. They're bouncy. Sometimes they come out really quickly if it's a good delivery. And what you need to know is the football catch. Do you see how the hands are positioned on this football? Those babies come out quick sometimes, so you need to be ready to catch. Again, don't drop that baby. Don't you do it. I find this picture on Google, and I find it as one of the most disturbing pictures of all time, especially with the dad thumbs up picture. Super awkward. Anyway, when we're talking about crowning, so we're getting our hands ready in um, to prevent fast ejection out of the womb. And we're putting, we can even put two fingers in around the head to kind of stretch mom's introitus. So that way we can kind of pre help prevent that tearing and also help deliver the face around the nose. Our fingers inside the vagina are also gonna help us. And I wanted to add this little um, recommendation. Um, we're not obese. And um, if you have at any point an option, there's only a couple of reasons to do a real episiotomy from the emergency department. Many women have significant problems with the episiotomy later in life, and they can come back to sue you about this stuff. I do not recommend you do an episiotomy unless you can do nothing else. I will tell you the two examples in which I think that you need to do it. Otherwise, don't. Okay, so here are apparently real birth pictures. What I want you to see about this is that gushes of fluid, blood, or even mom's poo, super common. You need to know what to expect. If you've not been in a delivery, and you can see the nurse's face from the background there in that picture, but gushes of fluid are very common. If you have a chance, look around at that fluid and note the color. This is gonna help to see if there's meconium staining for the OBs later when you document this and you talk to the OB. So please notice the color of the fluid and expect gushes of fluid, gushes of blood, and maybe even some poo, okay? Do not, do not say ooh gross or any other uh-oh during the birth, okay? I say this because we're professionals and mamas don't want to hear uh-oh out of the provider, okay? We're all a little bit better than that. Do not say uh-oh. All right. So once the head has kind of started to come out, it's your job to put your fingers inside the vagina and feel around that baby's neck. This is step one, okay? You need to try to make sure that there is no cord wrapped around this neck. If there is you have to try to get the cord out. And a lot of times it's wrapped just once, but sometimes it can be wrapped multiple times. If you have the option, you wanna get your fingers underneath that cord and slowly one loop at a time, take it around the baby's face. So that way when the rest of the baby comes out, it doesn't choke itself to death. And it also doesn't cut off all of its blood supply and circulation. 
Now you can see this picture in the bottom here of this baby with multiple cord wraps around its neck. And sometimes you cannot get that cord off from around the baby's neck because it's strapped too tight or there's too many of them and um, the birth is stalling or something equally terrible is happening. So if you have this situation happen, what you can do is look at the other picture here. And that is somebody has not cut the baby, but they've cut the cord from around the baby's throat. This means that it's possible for the baby to still half be in mama when it takes its first breath or cries. And when you cut that cord, that's starting the timer of how long you have to get that baby out to take its first breath. Because the last thing you can do is resuscitate that baby half in mama. So you need to realize what you're doing if you choose to cut the cord early. It's not always a good situation. Please, please, please know what you're doing with this, okay? So if you have to cut the cord, you gotta clamp it because we don't want mama or baby to bleed out. And we also need to rush because we need that baby to come out after we cut that cord. So you're going to feel for the cord wrapped around the baby's neck and you're going to slowly get your fingers underneath it and pull it around baby's head if you can. And if you can't, you're gonna keep your fingers there to help prevent baby from choking and you may or may not have to cut it. Once the head comes out, typically the birth is going to happen very quickly. So sometimes you place your hands on the either side of the mandible or you can hold it like a football and you're going to um, gently apply downward traction. You're not pulling this baby's head out. And usually the baby's shoulders come out very quickly along with the rest of the baby. You want to try to hold the head and support the neck while catching that baby on your forearm. I know that there are a lot of specific motions here that you're taught to guide the baby upward and downward. But in real life, you don't have time to guide that baby up and down. Usually it comes or it doesn't come. So we're either stuck or it comes really, really fast. You don't have time for all of these fancy movements. I'm just being real with you, okay? I highly recommend you get an assistant with a blanket to hand the baby to because you're gonna need both hands. What you want the minute that baby comes out is you wanna start suctioning the baby's mouth and nose with your bulb suction, okay? You can see all the goo and all of the fluid around this baby. We don't need that to be in baby's lungs. So we wanna stimulate this baby by suctioning out both nose holes right, both nares and the back of the throat. And we wanna be vigorous about it, do this at least twice. And then when you hand off the baby to the assistant, have the assistant or yourself rub the baby with the towel. Now, it is really important to know that before you do anything else, before you cut or anything, a lot of the OB's big trends right now is to do skin to skin time with mama. And if this birth has gone pretty good so far, it is okay to remove the blankets and put baby onto mama's belly or her chest and just, just like give her the baby even with the cord still attached. If everything's going okay and the baby's taking its first breath, you are okay to do this, okay? If it's a shit show and something's gone wrong, baby's not taking a breath, mama's bleeding out or super high or you're in a car or whatever it is, it is okay not to do skin to skin time because this is not an ideal birth, okay? This is okay not to do, don't let anyone feel you guilty about this, okay? It's also not your job to announce the sex and I will tell you why a little bit later in this um, lecture, but please don't. Okay. Just make sure your job is deliver that baby. Okay. And make sure to suction it out and have its first breath. If it's not breathing, you're going to need to go resuscitate it. Okay. Do not give it to mama if it's not breathing. All right. When babies come out, they come out very purpley. 
And it doesn't matter which size or sex they are. It doesn't matter how long they've been in there. All babies come out this weird purpley color and they're always coated in weird amniotic fluid stuff that's like yellow or, or weird colors and it's okay, all right? Just, that is not pus, don't worry about it. Hand, if that baby's taking a first breath, give it to mama, okay? Um, have your nurses, if you have time, record the APGAR scores. You wanna do it at one minute and at five minutes. However, again, beautiful reminder, the ER, it's not always perfect. If you don't have time to do this, don't worry about it. Couple of words on cutting the cord here. I know that this is a beautiful thing that usually the daddy gets to do, but this is the ER and shit's happening. So daddy may not get to even be near here and daddy may not even be in the room. So too freaking bad. Notice that you need two clamps. Many of the birth packaging, for some reason, if the ER has it, only has one. Why? I'm not really sure, but you don't want just one clamp because mama is gonna bleed out or baby is gonna bleed out. Neither is good, so we want two clamps. And then you cut in between the clamps. This lovely image up here mentions seven inches and 10 inches, which is a really nice number, but that's also really ideal. And I have no idea and I don't have time to measure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clamp it where I can clamp it. That's it. If you have extra time, Grab three clamps. Three clamps means that you can put an extra clamp here and you can cut this section of cord out and you can save that section of cord where the OB or later the pathologist can get some blood out of the cord. This is cord blood and a lot of mamas and babies and all that stuff want it. That's a luxury again. So if you can't get it or you don't have time, fine. Some umbilical cords have knots in it. You can see a picture of a real umbilical cord with a real knot in it in this bottom picture. If a cord has a knot in it, it's really handy to clamp the area around that knot so we can send it to pathology. But otherwise, again, I realize this is not an ideal situation, okay? It's okay to delay the clamping if everything is great. If everything is not great, you do what you can, right? Just make sure you have a minimum of two clamps because we don't need anyone bleeding. All right. Now we get into what happens if it goes wrong, which it probably does because this is the ER, right? Nothing is ideal. First thing to know, umbilical cord prolapse. If the cord comes out before the baby, as you can see in this very beautifully drawn picture, the baby's skull is going to compress against the cord. This means that the baby is not getting any nutrients, blood flow, or oxygen while it's being pushed through mom's vagina. That is not great because mom's vagina isn't an area where you can breathe. So literally mom's vagina is suffocating this baby and it will be born dead. That's not ideal. So if you can, your job is to put your fingers in and elevate that head, prevent it from coming through the vagina and try to push the cord, not just up around the skull, but up all the way into mom's vagina and around the neck or shoulder area where it has area to flow to the baby, at least until we can deliver the head. If you cannot do this, you have only two options. The first option is, to have mama turn over on all fours, like the picture in the bottom right. This can help use gravity to push baby back inside mama and also help my, make the angling of pushing the cord back in easier. However, if you're not confident you can get that cord back in, you have to present, keep your fingers in there and call OB and a helicopter and you can't take your fingers out and prevent the baby from coming out and resist all mama's contractions until either an OB can come in and do a C-section or until this birth happens and the baby dies. Uh, the latter is not ideal. So try to do your 100% best. Now let's talk about shoulder dystocia. Bigger babies are at higher risk. This is why we care if mama was a gestational diabetic because babies at nine pounds or bigger are going to be 
harder to deliver. So the way we know that shoulder dystocia has happened is we're going to look for something called turtle sign. Okay. Turtle sign means that we're able to deliver baby's head without much issue. However, nothing happens after we deliver the head. It just kind of gets stuck right there. And it kind of comes in a little bit and then out a little bit and then in a little bit and then out a bit, little bit. And we're not making any progress. We're like a turtle sticking the head in and out, in and out, in and out of the shell. Notice the anatomical drawings here both show mama's pelvis, which is that blue piece or the pink piece in the other picture that um, is getting stuck and holding back the anterior shoulder. That anterior shoulder means that that baby's shoulder is too wide to get around the pelvis and that's why we're stuck. A lot of providers used to try to pull the baby out this way. They would panic and they would pull. And what ends up happening is they pull the brachial plexus and they stretch it. And if they are able to get the baby out, that baby can't use the arm. That's not really great either. So don't try to rip the baby out of mama. Instead, try the McRoberts position. Notice that what we're doing here is we're putting mama's knees up to her chest, both of them, right? We just took off one leg so you could see what's happening. And you're going to apply pressure or somebody is going to apply super pubic pressure to kind of push that baby's shoulder down around that bone. Now I have seen people who get helpers to push mama's legs up. And this is something that dad can do or your nurse helpers can do. However, a lot of people put pressure on mom's pelvic bone. The bone ain't gonna move. Put pressure above the bone where the baby's shoulder is stuck, okay? Don't push on the bone, push right above the bone. McRoberts position is really useful for birth. This is especially useful for car births. So if you get the chance and you need to deliver, use the McRoberts position. If you can only remember one big thing about this lecture, it's always do McRoberts position if things aren't going appropriately because this position will really help you in the birth. If that doesn't work, hopefully you've already called for help. You can see the random pathway in which we can go through this. So if the McRoberts maneuver is not working, what we're gonna do next at this point is we're going to deliver the shoulders. And what I mean by that is you're going to reach into mom and you're gonna see if you can find the posterior shoulder. And that's not the shoulder that's stuck, right? That's the shoulder that is probably down by mama's bottom and you're gonna see if you can find the hand or the arm and you're gonna to try to pull the arm or the hand out with the head, okay? So that means the baby is gonna look like she's raising her hand, right? Or his hand. That will hopefully help give more space to deliver the anterior shoulder. And a lot of times baby will then get delivered out. If that doesn't work, then you're gonna to have to have mom go to all fours. Okay, a lot of people at this point used to do an episiotomy. This seems silly to me and everyone else, which is why they quit doing it, because the problem is mom's bones and the baby's position. It has nothing to do with the soft tissue at the front. Don't do an episiotomy here, even if you're panicked, because the problem isn't her tissue. The problem is the bones and the baby. So please, please don't do an episiotomy. The very last choice, okay? If this has gone on for longer than about 10 minutes and nothing is working and you've tried all of these things, you might need to break this baby's clavicle. And by that, I mean, you have to put your thumb on one of the baby's clavicles, probably the one that's being stuck, and you have to push real hard to break the clavicle. This is about the same pressure as breaking a chicken bone if you've ever prepared chicken. So this isn't gonna be the massive feat of strength that you think it will. It's gonna be easier than you think, but if you need to do it because you have tried all of these things at least two times and nothing is working, 
break that clavicle and get that baby out. Because after 10 to 15 minutes, we have a really high risk of death on the, the mom's part, the baby's part, hemorrhage, cerebral palsy, and so many more problems. So please, please, Try all of these things. Make sure you don't do an episiotomy and break the clavicle last. Now, you can have a breech delivery. There's many different kinds of breech delivery, but the long and the short is the baby is on the wrong side. It is important that you know that if the baby is a footling breech, you probably need to reach in and grab out the other foot so that way the baby will come out in one piece rather than with one leg stuck up by the head or some such. It's also important to notice that if we have twins for some reason, one baby is going to be in the appropriate position and the other baby is going to be breech. This almost always happens. So if mom has twin pregnancy, delivering in the ER is not the best. This is why a lot of OBs will deliver twin pregnancies as C-section only because breech delivery is difficult. There's a lot of risk factors that will cause breech deliveries. This is a list of them in case you're interested. I will never test on those, but sometimes it's really handy to know because when a mom says something um, like one of these things, you can start thinking breech delivery. Now here, delivering a breech baby is going to be different than delivering a regular baby. Notice that the head is gonna be delivered last, which is a little bit difficult because the head is the hardest to deliver. So a lot of babies can get stuck in mom's vagina with, again, being suffocated by her vagina. Remember that the head is going to compress against that cord which is not ideal during the delivery. So we don't want the baby half stuck out. So whenever possible, you need to put your hands or your two fingers on the cheekbones. Notice that you're not putting them in the eyes. Be careful with that. So you put the two cheekbones, you put your fingers on the two cheekbones and that's how you hold the head. And notice that you're delivering face first. So it doesn't matter if the, the mom or the I'm sorry, it doesn't matter if the baby is face down or face up. You wanna to try to deliver the face first and then you want to move that body onto its back. So in this particular picture, notice that all of the babies are face down. So that means that you're pushing that baby's rest of the body up. So that way you deliver the face first and you protect the spine by taking the rest of the skull out. So if this baby was a breech delivery and for some reason it was face up, you would need to take the baby's body and you would need to put that baby's body down while holding the head to deliver the face first and then the skull. This is the only time or one of the times that I mentioned that an episiotomy might help if the baby's head is stuck and you can't get this baby's head out. Remember that time is of the essence and one of the problems here isn't just the bones, but it could also be the tissue. Notice that suprapubic pressure can also help. So if you need to, suprapubic pressure by an assistant, as well as a potential episiotomy might help here. Another thing that can happen that's very scary is something called failure to progress. If mom's cervix is 10 centimeters and you know that the delivery was imminent, but it's still not coming and still not coming and it's still not making any progress and you can't feel like anything is happening, you need to recall OB and you need to get a transfer for a helicopter. Something is wrong. Baby can't come out. We don't know what it is, but this mama needs a C-section and she needs one fast. This is why we call the helicopter or we call OB or we call whatever needs to happen because this mama needs a C-section. All right, now we have a baby and we have a mama, which means we have two patients. Remember how I told you that this is actually where the hard part starts because it's really hard to manage two different patients who are very, very sick and dependent on you and only being one person. All right, you can imagine here 
that with a baby, the first big thing that we care about is airway. The second big thing we care about is airway. And the third big thing we care about is airway. Okay. So in case you aren't getting this from my repetitive obnoxiousness, right? We need to care about that airway, 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 airway. We want that baby to take that first breath. If baby takes the first breath, you hand off that baby to someone else, to your most capable nurses to dry and clean and do the APGARs and all that. And the reason why is because when the baby is born, dad and the paramedics and the nurses and everybody in that room who is so excited and they want to be the first or the second or the third to look at the baby, the only person in that room that is looking at that mom is you. The only person who is looking at that mom is you. So if there's a terrible complication, if she's bleeding out in the corner, nobody is watching. And this is how deaths happen. So your responsibility, once that baby taking that first breath, is the mama every time. So let's talk about troubleshooting because again, nothing goes well in the ER. So the first thing is if the baby doesn't take a breath, right? So it's all about that first breath. So the number one goal is to ventilate. So when that baby is first born, it, it takes an incredible amount of pressure to take your very first breath. And the heart rate and the survivability of that baby is always going to be ventilation first. I know that we learned the opposite in ACLS and we care a whole lot about chest compressions and IVs and meds. None of that matters here. We don't care about IV lines or medicines or even chest compressions right now. What we care about and our number one focus on that baby is to ventilate. So the very first thing that you got to know is we got to do that bulb suctioning and we want to do stimulation. So that's what we do with the towel when we rub and clean it all off. Okay. We want to bother that kid. We want it to cry. Okay. The next big thing that can really help us positioning. Remember that baby's heads are big and heavy. So if the kid's head is bent on its neck or bent really back far, it may not be able to take a deep breath. So maybe you'll have to put a little towel or something underneath its shoulders to clear its airway so that way it can take that first breath. If none of these three things that you have done very quickly are working, the next number one thing that you need to go to is bag mass valve or positive printer positive pressure ventilation. Now, positive pressure ventilation is um, what is demonstrated over here in this picture of this very, very small baby. Think of it like high flow nasal cannula, only it's providing positive pressure to fill the airway with air. Not all amazing emergency departments are going to have positive pressure, pressure ventilation for infants this small. Some do, and if yours does, you're freaking lucky, but you probably also have OB, right? Or anesthesia or a pediatric ICU. For the rest of us, you might just have bag mass valve. Try to use a very small one if you have it and bag that baby because its life depends on it. If your bag mass valving is working, the heart rate will increase. And that's how you know you did good and you're effective. There's a big myth out there that if the baby doesn't take its first breath after suctioning and stimulation, a lot of providers panic and they first go to intubate. Please don't. As you can see from this picture with this positive pressure ventilation, some of these kids are crazy small. And the truth is some of these can be dangerous for a first time provider who's not used to it to intubate these small, small airways, especially because sometimes you can cause more damage than not because you're just not used to it. And that's just the truth. We need to know where our weaknesses lie. So the big truth here is that if you are effective at bag mass valving that baby or your respiratory therapist is effective at it and that heart rate comes up and they're doing okay with a little bit of extra help from you or someone doing that bagging, 
you can bag that kid until the helicopter or help or the OB or whoever it is arrives. And that's what I want you to do. Okay. We're not into being heroes. We're into like the effectiveness of this, right? All that matters is that kid lives. You don't need to be a hero and you don't need to cause more damage by intubating. I'm not saying you can't, but if you get a good pressure and you get that kid to cry or you get that kid to breathe and you get that heart rate up with the bag mass valve, that's all you need. If you do have to resuscitate after the airway is secure, you can cannulate the umbilical cord. Don't put an IV in that tiny little arm or that tiny little leg. Put a angiocath into the umbilical vessel as shown in the top picture. This is significantly easier than pretty much any IV or any procedure that we have ever done. So if you're really worried about this, you do cannulate the umbilical cord. If you do have the worst happen and you have to intubate the baby, make sure it's your last resort. Make sure you've tried other things. Never, 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 maybe I'll say it again because I'm you know, very good at being obnoxious. Never use RSI meds. You don't want to paralyze this baby. That's exactly the opposite of what we want to happen. Okay. And you don't want to sedate this baby either. Again, that's the opposite of what is happening. I know that we're used to this in adults or even kids who have taken their first breath, but we want them to breathe on their own. So never use RSI meds. I know it's instinctual, but don't you dare. Next is know that the airway is more anterior and that because of that, it should be more shallow and superficial, but their mouth is only so big. So you can see here a picture, two different pictures of intubating a baby where you're gonna need to use like a lot wider of a grip to be able to see down those tiny little tubes. Whereas if you intubated like you would an adult, you won't be able to see anything. And no glidoscope currently makes any handles that are gonna be able to see down a neonate's um, tubes. So this is almost always exclusively gonna be direct. And again, notice that we're using an, an uncuffed or non-cuffed tube. A lot of people like to use tubes without styluses for kids of this age. And sometimes it's too floppy. And I have been panicked before because I could not get the tube in. So what we had to do instead was we used a paper clip as a stylus, something you can definitely try if you need to. If you get the tube in, be sure to take a chest x-ray like you would with an adult. And you can put surfactant down the tube to try to open up the airways. Also important, do not hook up this baby lung to an adult ventilator. It will blow out their lungs and they will die, okay? Some adult vents do have pediatric settings. If they do, super but just be sure to check and remind your respiratory therapist because it's your license on the line. Also call for a helicopter. A lot of the helicopters, if your hospital is tiny in the middle of nowhere, will be supplied for pediatric vents. Sometimes you just gotta call the helicopter for their equipment, right? Intubating these kids is really difficult because you have to know which tube to use and how many pounds or grams they are and what their gestation is. And sometimes the mom only speaks Spanish and you don't really know and your baby weight thing doesn't work or you can't figure it out. And this is a big pain in the butt and nobody has this memorized. So the best friend of your life in this moment is the Braslow tape. If you don't know what it is, this is what it looks like. And you literally just measure the kid and it will tell you all of your sizes and dosages for important resuscitation, pre-medication, induction, paralytics, and maintenance. So basically it's telling you absolutely everything you need to know without doing any math, which is the best thing ever. Braslow tapes are also easily available on Amazon. So if your hospital doesn't have one, I think they cost 50 bucks or less. So it's really worth your time, energy, and effort to 
to have one in your bag. Now, there are some more things that can go wrong that may not involve intubation. Maybe the kid takes a breath or maybe it doesn't. And there are things that we need to mentally prepare for now. Let's start with chorioamnitis. This baby is typically one where the, the water has already ruptured. So it's called premature rupture of membranes. And even though the water is ruptured, the baby wasn't done cooking. And so instead of being born with that chalky yellow substance all over them, baby can be born with pus and a foul smell. Most moms are going to know about this, but not all. And because ER is crazy, you need to know that if a foul smell is delivered with the baby and it looks like real gooey pus is all over the kid, you need to give mom IV gentamicin and ampicillin, both. It's also important to know that they're going to have a harder time with labor. So if something is going wrong and you're getting bad smells, Again, you're gonna maybe wanna have your OB on speakerphone and have them kind of walk you through what's going on. Another thing that really happens very commonly in the emergency department is something called placental abruption. Placental abruption means that the placenta has been pulled off of the uterus so mom can't oxygenate and give the baby nutrients. Remember that this is baby's only source, so we're in a rock and a hard place because this baby will die without it. This is a scary thing because trauma is one of the most common causes of placental abruptions. This is why usually pregnant moms have to be taken to the nearest hospital to get ultrasounded and look for placental abruptions. A lot of people I have seen ignorantly discharge these mamas because they're not bleeding. Notice that this one up here has a placenta really high up. And even though the placenta was ripped off the wall, the bleeding is in between the uterus and the placenta. So down here in her vagina, she ain't bleeding, but she still has a hell of a lot of pain and she still has a placental abruption. So know that bleeding is not always present in placental abruptions, but it will be very painful. So always ask these mamas about pain. We're talking about the kind of pain that a dissection patient would feel. This is no easy task to handle. So if you have a placental abruption, this is always an emergency. Usually they want to do a C-section. Usually they'll helicopter these patients. Definitely call OB immediately. Um, the other most common cause of placental abruptions is going to be cocaine. Although it's really poor form to accuse mama of doing cocaine if she hasn't had any trauma just because she has a placental abruption. We don't always know why placental abruptions happen, so don't be accusatory. Another thing that can happen is that mom can deliver a baby and it can be an easy delivery or a hard delivery, but the baby can be delivered dead. Um, it's important that you know what you're going to do if the baby is delivered and it is dead. Uh, one of the things that will tip you off is a lot of times the skin will be sloughing. A lot of times when you put the hand on the chest, you won't feel a heartbeat and they won't respond to any stimulation. If this happens, mom almost always knows something's off unless she's super high. Um, so you have to decide if you're going to be the person who tells the mama or who does not. And, um, that's kind of up to you. I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do it, but I do think that it's important to treat this mama like she's a person. And if she knows something's off, I do think that you shouldn't hide it. I do think that if she asks you directly what's going on, I think it's worth your time to tell her. I also think it's important that you know that medical needs should far outweigh the parents' feelings, social propriety, or your feelings. So always deal with what is medical first. And if the baby is dead, while it's worth your time to try to resuscitate for a little while, don't forget to deal with the post-birth. 
if it doesn't happen and the baby dies, and this does happen in the emergency department, don't forget that mama still has to deliver that placenta. And while that may not be the most happy or ha cheerful thing to do, that is still under EMTALA. You cannot transfer that mama until that placenta is, is delivered. So please, please, please don't forget about the mama in this situation, even though it's probably a really difficult thing. You also have to deal with the fact that some babies are born and they're not what's expected. They could have confusing genitalia or strange anatomical abnormalities. And this is why we don't announce what sex the baby is. Because instead of seeing a penis or a vagina, you see more feet. I don't really know how to answer if that's a boy or a girl. And that's why you should not be announcing this. Same goes with this um, intestine that's out of the baby's abdomen. If this has abnormal anatomy, it's your call as to whether you can do skin to skin or not. Sometimes it's better to hand the baby off and have the nurse wrap it up, like in the case of this large amount of heart or maybe even intestine that's sticking out of the baby's abdomen. If there's a lot of medical problems, you might not even need to wrap that with wet gauze before you do anything else. I also want to bring your attention to this baby here. This is called a Harlequin baby. And this is the, I guess, the result of problem with genetics. Um, and this baby is alive. Um, these were often called demon babies. Um, back in the Middle Ages, and it's kind of a really ridiculous, hard thing to handle if that was born and moving and alive, and what do you tell the mom? I'm not really sure that the answer is, but you have to decide if there's some abnormality. Maybe it's best to hand off the baby and not necessarily be the one to tell the mom. Don't forget that after all of these weird situations, you're still not done with the mom. Remember that you're the only provider who is looking to mom when that baby is born. So I wanna to talk to you about placental delivery. Most placentas take about 30 minutes after the baby is born, but not all. Some of them can be delivered in 15 minutes. Some of them come out in 10. So typically in good deliveries, we have to gently hold and put constant pressure on the umbilical cord. You don't want to manhandle this and you definitely don't want to rip the cord off the placenta, okay? So you want just gentle, constant pressure and the placenta will release and then it will come out. You should be, besides resuscitating baby, you should be starting Pitocin or Oxytocin on this mom. If you don't know the dosages, you should go review those. Remember that you don't need an IV to start that Pitocin. You also want to provide that um, external or suprapubic pressure onto mama's uterus to get that uterus to kind of start clamping down. Here is the difference between oxytocin and Pitocin. Pitocin is just synthetic. Oxytocin is naturally occurring. There's a big debate going on in the OB world about whether oxytocin or Pitocin is better, whether there's more bad outcomes with Pitocin or not. I don't know if it is or not, but I do know that whatever your hospital has is what this mom's going to get because again, this is an ED delivery. Okay. Also notice that if you want to give mom 10 units, it's IM or it's 20 to 80 IV. And we usually put it in a one liter normal saline bag, okay? These are things that you could easily look up on Google or if you know them, it would be even better. The fundal massage is something that everybody needs to know after delivering a baby in the placenta. That uterus needs to contract down so mom doesn't keep bleeding. One of the biggest problems after birth, one of the reasons why birth is so dangerous is that a lot of times that oxytocin doesn't hit mom fast enough. And so we get something called uterine acne. 
And uterine atony means that the uterus doesn't shrink down fast enough and it bleeds and bleeds and bleeds and bleeds and bleeds and pretty soon the mom dies of blood loss. So we are going to rub firmly on mom's stomach to get that uterus to contract. Okay, this does help shrink the uterus. This is a really important part. Do not forget this. Okay, I also want you to know that you're not just lightly massaging her tummy. This is hard and rough. It's usually pretty uncomfortable for mom and for you. But this is the time when you got to be the provider. You cannot be her friend. So you got to really wrench down on that uterus to make sure that she's not going to be bleeding. After you've done this, it's really nice to be able to put the placenta in a tray and to be able to look for abnormalities. This is something that really pads your chart and helps you later because lawsuits are abundant. So you wanna look at the umbilical cord and note abnormalities. There's supposed to be two arteries, right? Arteries are away and one vein. So if you're cannulating the umbilicus, you want to cannulate the vein. Notice that um, the pictures down below, not all umbilical cords have that. There are very frequent abnormalities, and this is something that you should be noticing. Also something you should notice is if you flip the um, placenta over, it has what looks like ground meat, also known as cotyledons. This is where the placenta was in the uterus. If you flip the placenta over and you notice that some of the ground meat is missing, like it is down here in this picture, you have to go in and get it, or you have to at least tell the OB, hey, I think part of the placenta is retained. This means that the mama is going to keep bleeding, and this means that we're going to probably have some postpartum hemorrhage. So if it doesn't come, the placenta, after 30 minutes, or if there's a cotyledon missing, you have to put your hand in and very gently work your way all the way around that uterus and find that extra piece or that placenta and very gently, not hard, gently pull that placenta or the piece of the placenta out of the mama. You gotta scoop it out. You gotta make sure that you gotta give it time, right? The full 30 minutes is required before you do this. But you also need to know that retained placenta is the most common cause of septic moms. This is why we have to go in and get it before her uterus shrinks down again. Postpartum hemorrhage is probably the most common abnormality left because again, everybody starts looking at baby and they ignore mama and mama bleeds out. Okay, so if you have a vaginal birth and you have more than 500 mLs of blood, as is shown in this picture, that's a postpartum hemorrhage. Besides doing our fundal massage, which is still number one, you need to be given that Pitocin or oxytocin. Remember, it's 10 units IM or it's mixed in a nasal uh, normal saline infusion. If mama's bleeding and still bleeding, you need to give one gram of IV transexemic acid, also known as TXA, over 10 minutes. There is a lot of evidence now saying that this can really make a difference and it's not gonna hurt. So please, please, please do it. Most ERs have transexemic acid, please give it. If these things don't happen, remember that you need to be looking for the cause. One of the causes is retained placental, um, re retained placenta. So look at that cotyledons. It won't take you that long to notice, huh, there's a big chunk missing. I need to go in and get it out, okay? Or you can ask mom if she's a bleeding problem. There's a couple of other uh, medications that we can give sometimes from uh, the pharmacy. And so you can call and you can give one of these medications. Probably one of the most common is misoprostol or Cytotec, which you can put in mama's rectum and it will clamp down on that uterus and help prevent postpartum hemorrhage. However, you should know it can make the mama have a fever and it can also make her pretty tachycardic, which makes her bleed faster. So there are lots of side effects on a lot of these medications. 
It's worth your time to really look over this and understand it and know where to look this up if you need it. So let's practice a quick delivery case. So your nurse comes and grabs you because someone needs help in the parking lot. There's a mom delivering in the back of a car. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna grab a couple of things real quick. You're gonna grab two or three umbilical clamps or some kind of clamp. You're gonna grab a blanket, you're gonna grab a scissors. And if you have time, you're gonna grab gloves and a tray. That does mean if you have time, if you don't have time, you just gotta go and ask somebody to grab those things for you. Then you're gonna get to the back of the car and you're, you're gonna see that mom is in there trying to push. Your number one thing to do at this point is to find out how imminent is this delivery? Do we have time or don't we? You open up the legs. If you see the baby, your only job at this point is to catch. I don't care whether you got your gloves or not. Then, you're, if you don't see the baby, you're going to try to time those contractions and you're going to put your fingers in to see if you feel the cervix and the effacement. And you're going to ask the mom how many babies has she delivered. Those few things will tell you how imminent this is. If you still have time, right, maybe you can get her on a stretcher. But if you don't, now is not the time. You're going to stay in the car, okay? If you have maybe you're not quite sure how much, you're gonna ask other people, cause there's always inevitably other people who wanna look at this, to get a couple things. Get the stretcher just in case, get an ultrasound maybe, get a couple of helpers in case you need to pass the baby off. Maybe ask one of your nurses to go get your equipment or ask them to go get a 10 units of I am Pitocin in a syringe so that way they can give it to the mama right after the birth. Maybe you could ask one of the nurses to put in an IV, go in the other door. And maybe you'll have time to ask mama questions. Not always, but sometimes. If you just have to deliver as this person is, okay, if there's any birth problems, the very first thing that you need to do is do that McRoberts position, right? And you do not pull this baby's head. Do that football hold and just let mama push, okay? As mama's pushing, once the head comes out, you're gonna feel around that neck for a cord, okay? If you feel one, you wanna get your finger under there and you want to pull the loop over the head. If you can't, you just hold your fingers there and prevent that from choking baby. And if you can, you can cut the cord if you're really, really bold. Finally, you catch the baby and you can put it on mom as that's probably the most convenient at this point. And we can delay clamping of this cord if possible for a few minutes. And this is just because the delivery was not ideal, but we have time in this particular delivery. Remember that you don't always have to. Then you're going to do some bulb suction and you're going to stimulate the baby, even on mom's belly. You're going to suction out the baby's mouth and nose and you're going to rub it as good as you can with your shirt or dad's shirt or the blanket that you maybe got. Then it's either going to cry or it's not. If it's not crying, you need to clamp the cord and give the baby to the nurses to go resuscitate the baby. If it is crying, you still need to clamp the cord and then you probably need to give the baby to the nurses so you can get the mom out of the car, okay? Don't forget that mom needs her 10 units of Pitocin or you can start the Pitocin and IV fluids. When you have time and you do have time in between baby's delivery and the placental delivery, get mom onto the stretcher and into a room. Remember that you don't want to lose the umbilical cord on the way because sometimes it can retract up inside mom. So you want to clamp it and maybe leave the clamp out or have somebody hold it while mom is walking into the room or mom shouldn't be walking. So while the stretcher is going into the, the emergency department. And then once you get into the room, you might have time to deliver the placenta to watch for bleeding you're going to check on the baby's status and see if you need to resuscitate. And you're going to not forget about that fundal massage. Once that placenta comes out, 
you're going to check it for cotyledons, you're going to look at the umbilical cord, and you're going to send off that tray to, to pathology and hopefully transfer mom and baby, hopefully who are all doing well, up to OB. And now when you finally are done, you're now allowed and have time to pee your pants about how crazy that was. If you guys have any questions for me, you can leave them below. Otherwise, thanks for listening.